Welcome back to Made for More. I am your host, Holly J. Moore. This is a podcast where every episode we give you one tool, at least one tool, to show up as the best version of yourself in your life because it's so much better to thrive than to just merely survive. Today and every day, I am joined by my producer, Aaron Bender. I am so excited, Holly, about this episode because we've talked on Made for More about mental health, physical mm-hmm. health, yeah. um, you know, how to get over breakups and divorces and things like that. Yeah. And today is actually the first episode where we focus on finances. Yes, money. Money makes the world go round. Yes, and what's nice is Craig has brought money for all of us. <laughs> I wish that were true. I yes. opened the door. He had no money. <laughs> no money. Yes. Aaron, do you think money can buy you happiness? Yeah, I don't know if it necessarily buys happiness. I think it's kind of the other way around, where if you are happy and content and grateful, then the money will come. Mm, that That's kind yes. of how I look at it. Yeah. 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 I think I totally agree with that. Um, But I also think like money can buy you freedom and who doesn't want to live life on their own terms, right? Like, I mean, it's a terrible feeling when you feel like you have no options. Um, And sometimes, you know, when you don't have enough money to live the life that you want to live, you feel kind of like you have no options. You're paralyzed. So when, I, I think it buys you freedom. When you were starting to say that money buys you, f- I thought you were going to say faucet. <laughs> oh, we'll talk about the faucet. <laughs> Don't you worry. I can't wait. I am here today with Craig Strom, a man who wears so many hats, I didn't even know how to introduce him. So, Craig, why don't you take it away? Tell us who you are about yourself. All right. I am husband, father, financial planner, paralegal, crazy car guy, and a woodworker. Okay. How's that, right? That's good. The Renaissance man. Yes, yes. indeed, indeed. <laughs> oh, speak, you know, we, we we both broke into an accent there just then, which reminded me, you are also a professional podcaster with your own podcast. You've done like almost 300 episodes. Yes, I've, uh, I've done the podcasting thing. I've taken a hiatus, right? Is that what they say in the entertainment oh, business, right? Like a that. hiatus from podcasting yes. so that I could join uh, oh. events like this, <laughs> yes, right? Right. Excellent. So yes, that's outstanding. Okay. So the reason why the accent made me think of your podcast is because at the end of your podcast, yes. a with a British <laughs> accent comes on and I'm like, I might want to do that. I might want to like end with a British accent. Yes. It's amazing what you can find on Fiverr. (laughs) (laughs) Cool. Very cool. Well, I love your podcast because it's like short bursts of really practical financial information. Thank you. So listeners, if you want more of what you're going to hear today, go to Craig's podcast, The Income Engineer. Yeah. You can find me Craig with a K, Craig with a K, Strom. You just Google that and you'll find plenty of stuff. Yes. Lots of stuff. (laughs) Yes. Cool. Um, Okay, well, as I was listening to your podcast, I I felt so attacked because (laughs) there was one episode where you were talking about kitchen faucets and you were like, these people who spend, you know, five grand on a faucet, like how absurd can you be? And I'm listening to the podcast going, but you don't know the joy (laughs) that a $5,000 faucet can bring because- (laughs) I have one of the most amazing kitchen faucets. Yes, they can be quite nice. And I fell in love with one. I know exactly where it lives on display. I want to sneak in and go grab it right mm. now. <laughs> right? So I love I love fine things. Mm-hmm. Don't get me wrong. Yes, Never, you do. Yeah. Because let's just interject. The reason I drive a Porsche is because of you. Thank you. So, yes. you know. And, I gave and you a Porsches sip of the Kool-Aid. Not, you did. Yes. yes. So clearly you like nice things. Absolutely like nice things. But if you notice on my cup, uh, mm-hmm. my my motto in many things is buy it cheap, right? <laughs> I, might, I want nice things and I have some very nice things. Yes. But even my wood shop, I bought my wood shop way cheap. It's one of my very favorite things is those items that I enjoy, like yes. your faucet. I love my kitchen faucet because <laughs> I got a great deal on my kitchen faucet and it's okay. the one I wanted, but it isn't necessarily the pretty one that you have. And I, so <laughs> uh, there's, there's a fine line with that. Mm-hmm. And 
if it fits and it brings you joy and it did not interfere with your ability to do other things and benefit other parts of your life, then why not get the fancy faucet? It's okay. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. The, okay. Done. We're done. We're the, done. Our We're work out. here is done. That's all I needed to hear. <laughs> he has validated my faucet. We can be done. Yes. Yes, exactly. That's all I wanted you for. No, I'm just kidding. Um, you, you're good for so much more than that. Um, Thank you. Because <laughs> you're welcome. I, I know on your podcast, you also do like this segment where you have like deal of the week, right? Yes. I, I love the deal of the week. Um, it was inspired by Clark Howard, who is a, a, a deal guy, a finance guy that came out of the travel industry and made a name for himself being that kind of cheapskate, but a very rich cheapskate. <laughs> and I always love that. I, I okay. So I have some extremely fancy, very nice things and... In addition to liking that very nice thing, I love the fact that I have, for example, Alan Edmonds shoes. I have Alan Edmonds, you know, handmade shoes, and yeah. and I think they are just the you know they're great. But yeah. when I tried them on for the first time at South Coast Plaza, <laughs> they're extremely uncomfortable. Oh, and I thought these are very disappointing. They yes. were seven hundred dollars a pair. Very yes. disappointing. Very uncomfortable. Mm. So, I eBayed it. And I now have two pairs of <laughs> Allen Edmund shoes that have been refinished by my shoe cobbler. Oh. And I spent $70 a pair. Really? Okay, but are they real? <laughs> they are absolutely real. Really? I walked back into the Allen Edmund store and the snooty person behind the counter <laughs> looked down at my feet and said, hello, sir, how can I help you? Oh. And he identified my shoes immediately. Really? And, and I became one of the yeah, Alan Edmonds yeah. customers. <laughs> I was part of the crowd. Oh. And, and I loved the fact that yeah. I had spent less than $200 <laughs> on my two pairs of Allen Edmonds. Now, I don't right. wear them because they are still very uncomfortable. Oh, no. <laughs> Granted, they were broken in likely by someone who passed away because mm. I bought them on eBay, <laughs> but I still like them enough. And, and anyway, that's just me. I love, I love to find ways to make the dollar, yeah. whatever it is that you have available, go further, right? right? So that you can do other things with it and enjoy other parts of your life because you didn't spend it all in one place. I guess right. that's a good way to put it. That's yeah. where the buy it cheap comes from. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, I guess it's like just as much as, as the finer things, you know, that I buy at full price most of the time. That gives me joy. You get the same joy out of like finding gr great deals. Yes. Uh, I, I And I get the same joy, I guess, even more so nowadays. Cause I used to be that I used to have that same attachment to buying that, that thing brand new. And mm. it was, I'm not sure where it happened, but it might've been with my daughter where my daughter was a Nordstrom girl. Like she okay. was raised as a Nordstrom yes. girl and it was all about running up to the Lancome counter oh, and, ah, yes. you know, yes. all that. And I would take her to Ross and she just thought I was the worst dad as a teenager and she had to be dragged into Ross. Well, she got out on her own mm, and, and started spending her Ross own money. So bad. And then I'm getting my daughter calling me bragging about the deal she found on oh. Facebook Marketplace and I'm just tearing up. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is great. Proud dad moment. <laughs> yes. So it's an interesting shift. So yeah. so I, I really started... I don't have to say becoming militant about it. And it became something that something of a challenge. Mm -hmm. and, and I, and I just took it on as a challenge that so many parts of my life, I would, I would hunt down the deal, right? Yeah. Even my house, you know, I, it was a deal. I, I, my car is a deal. I, my building, everything, I, all of these things. So it, that's something that I became passionate about. And then I had a few extra dollars to do other things with because right. I didn't spend it all on that thing. So, right. Yeah. yeah. So do you think that being, would you call yourself frugal? Very. Okay. Yeah. Frugal, but I won't sacrifice. I, I want to have a good life. I will yeah. not. Uh, the idea that some financial entertainers, like big name entertainers, uh -huh. like you should eat rice and beans. Like yes. I don't like rice and beans every day. You know, mm -hmm. maybe, yeah, maybe, but I don't like them every day. I'm not, I don't want to live my life that way. And I don't think anybody really would be excited about a financial planning goal that says you should sacrifice everything and live in that box over there. Right. You know, there's got to be a, a middle ground somewhere. Yes. So speaking of financial entertainers, I think I know who one of them you're talking about. <laughs> um, so Jeff and I, you know, we've been married for 20 years, started off with like no money. Um, and I remember him and I did financial Dave Ramsey's course, financial peace at the beginning yep. of our marriage. Yeah. Cause we, we actually, we kind of clashed at the beginning of marriage because 
he was brought up being very frugal and, you know, like probably lots of money in the bank in his right. family. I was brought up with the motto STS. Do you know what STS stands No, for? tell me. What's STS? Spend that shit. Yeah, spend yes. it. So if spend you could it. only imagine, like here over YOLO, here. YOLO, spend it. <laughs> right. We, we have like save every penny, you know, for retirement for right, any right, day. Right, right, right. If you don't need it, you know, you are you kidding me? You you got new shoes three years ago. Why do you need a new exactly. pair of shoes now? You know, that over here and then STS over here. Like you can imagine, right? <laughs> So at the beginning of our marriage, we did Financial Peace University, okay. and like it was super helpful. It was yeah. immensely helpful. But as we've gotten older, and you know now we have like a couple coins to rub together, which right. we didn't at the beginning. Right. I have found that like the advice of Dave Ramsey is is definitely not applicable to our life for the most part. Yeah, there's a lot of things that in the beginning, the fundamentals I agree with. It's okay. when you when you get into the world of now you've made a few pennies and mm. you you actually now start looking at things on a more sophisticated side of the of the line that the, the basic principles don't always work anymore. They just don't work. Right. And that's been an argument that I will have uh, probably until the time that I decide to hang up my financial planner, you know, uh, <laughs> hat, right? Okay. Is that they, they, the principles in the beginning, the basics, save, you know, be safe, all mm -hmm. that, you know, all that's good stuff. Yeah. You get to the point where you start looking at investments. You start right. looking at retirement planning. You start looking at the more even business planning. Yes. With, a, with a business like yours, for example, following those same principles can hold you back right. in the business sense. Yes. And I just don't believe that the end of the conversation is the soundbite on a radio show. Mm -hmm. Because if, if it was, I would lose my license, <laughs> right? The, the type of advice that's handed out by financial entertainers is advice that I would end up losing my license over mm -hmm. because you've got to go deeper. You've got to look at both sides. You've got to ask more questions. Right. Yeah. So if there's somebody watching or listening to this right now that like, you know, listens to Dave Ramsey or whatever, what would you tell them? Would Turn you say off the rate? No. Okay. No, <laughs> That's no. what I was wondering. Like, um, are, would you say like, do not listen to him? No, not at all. What I would, what I would say is ask the follow-up question. Right. So I just did a, I, I just made a post the other day. Um, it was regarding a life insurance question that someone asked. They asked me a life insurance question and Dave Ramsey. And was it the life insurance question I asked you yesterday? No, very similar. Okay. It, there's a questions that, that come up all the time about how much life insurance do I need at this stage of my life? Okay, fine. That's there. There's some answers that Dave Ramsey and I agree on and, mm. and many financial planners would agree as well. There are more advanced questions like what type of life insurance should I get? Well, in the Dave Ramsey financial entertainer world, anyone who would recommend cash value life insurance of any kind is the spawn of Satan, mm, right? It's okay. like no matter what in no matter what situation. Right. And so what I would encourage people to do is to step back and say, any situation? Really? Like, right. ask a few more questions. Is there any situation where that might make sense? And then you start realizing, for example, that banks and billionaires use cash value life insurance. Mm. Why would a bank or a billionaire use cash value life insurance if it was the worst thing ever? Well, the answer to that might be completely contrary to what your favorite financial entertainer has to say, <laughs> right? And yeah. so that's the part that, that I just encourage folks is if you're listening to that particular guru, that financial entertainer like Dave Ramsey or Susie Orman or whoever, ask the follow-up questions that don't fit in the 30-second soundbite on the radio show. Right. They just don't fit. Yeah. Not to mention the fact that Dave Ramsey has said certain things so many times on his books and radio shows, he cannot go back. If he goes back and admits a mistake, oh. it is his entire printed brand, work. Yeah. yeah, it's his whole brand has been centered around this thing. He can't go back. Right. Because he oh, said I'm it never, forever. Yes. So Ooh. anyway, that's, yeah. That's, I never thought about yeah. it that way. His big one is that that people that he's he's moved away from is that in the uh, investment world, you can average 12%. Yes. Really, <laughs> really, you can, oh, that's amazing. Right. You can do that, right? And in my world, where I don't operate under freedom of speech rules like he does, by the way, he used to be a licensed financial advisor. But he's actually not anymore. No, he gave them all up because he, if you listen long enough, and I've listened 
longer to him than most people would ever want to. Okay. Because I'm trying to see what's out there. Right. But if you listen to the reason why he gave up all of his licenses is so that no one could tell him what he could say. Oh. So he operates under freedom of speech rules where I operate under federal regulations. Right. Right. Like I have to actually be a fiduciary for the benefit of my client. Right. Which means there isn't usually one answer. Yeah. There's multiple answers that, that are different in certain situations. So anyway, get me so going. do you think people people listening to him realize he's not even a licensed financial no, planner? No, no, they, he is He is just a very good financial entertainer. And hmm. good on him because yeah. his fundamentals are awesome. Yeah. His fundamentals are awesome. And when you get to the point where you can pay cash for your Corvette and cash for your $9 million house mm-hmm. and cash for your business real estate, that's great. But the average person will never be able to achieve that which he has yeah. following his advice. Right. How many people have $300,000 cash available to buy their first rental property? Yeah, not it's, many. It's impossible. Mm-hmm. I mean, people just don't have that. There are financial mechanisms and correct principles that they can follow to achieve that. Yeah. But they have to ignore his fundamental never change advice. Right. You have to shift away from that financial guru, financial entertainer advice at some point, or you generally stop advancing. Right. So this is interesting because I was just talking to a a fellow business owner yesterday and she was talking about how she's like terrified to, to kind of go to the next level Mm -hmm. because, you know, she would maybe have to take out a line of credit. She needs some working capital. Yeah. So what before I, you know, I won't taint anybody with my thoughts. Like, what are your thoughts on leveraging debt? The, the word debt is the key piece to focus on right there. Okay. That if you have $100,000 in the bank and you have $20,000 on your credit card for the same business, $100,000 in the bank and $20,000 on your credit card, mm-hmm. are you in debt? No, mm-hmm. because you're in a positive equity position. Right. You're in an equity position oh, still. Right. Now, should you let that debt roll over and over and over and over and have high interest Probably rates not. and be irresponsible with it? Of course not. But debt is the position where you are worth less than your debt, than your, than your credit, mm-hmm. right? right? You're in a debt position when you're actually worth less than you owe, yeah. right? So if you're in a house that has, it's worth $1.5 million. You know, the average three bedroom, two bath house in California. <laughs> in California, <right>? yes. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I actually just, we, we were just doing a, um, uh, a, a call with someone that had that exact house, right? It was mm-hmm. the exact, uh, in San Diego County, three bedroom, two bath, $1.6 million house, yeah. right? Okay. If you have a $500,000 loan on your $1.5 million house, are you in debt? No, you have a million dollar positive net worth, right? right? You are Mm -hmm. net worth positive at a million dollars. It's the same thing we say about a business, that if your business is worth $5 million and you have a million dollar line of credit outstanding, you are technically in an equity position. Mm -hmm. Are you being responsible with the line of credit? Um, Did you buy a boat with it? (laughs) (laughs) Did you buy a boat with it, right? Um, And you're being irresponsible where you took that debt and you use that debt on a non-productive purchase, right? A non-productive asset. Okay, we could argue that's still not, but you're still in a positive equity position. Right. right. So debt is is generally where you are upside down on that, where you yes. actually owe more than you're worth. You're in debt. Yeah. Right. Now, again, being smart with it. Um, we have uh, many. Con- I've had many conversations about this over the years, 27 years coming up, that if you're going to go out and take out a line of credit on real estate, on a business investment, it needs to be just that. It needs to be an investment. It needs to be Mm -hmm. something that if you look at the chance of success of that particular uh, venture, that it it makes sense that it's worth it. Then you leverage that purchase using the most important thing in investments is buy it cheap with other people's money. Right. That's the, okay. That's the key. That's the key. Cause I'm always like, I'd rather use other people's money than my money. I'll keep yeah. my money sitting exactly. in Exactly. You keep your yes. money doing something else and for, for emergencies and opportunities yes. and you use someone else's money as long as the rate of return that you've calculated from your strategic move mm-hmm. makes sense. 
and a bank is willing to partner with you or a finance option is willing to come in. It could be venture capital. It could be family. It could be any number of things. If it makes sense and the numbers add up, using someone else's money almost always, and I'm not, again, everything is a maybe if possibly, yeah. almost always exponentially increases your rate of return by using someone else's money. Why? Okay. So so this is an interesting principle. Okay. okay. So I'm going to use this cup I'm in so front of me. Are you ready? This. Yes. Okay, this cup. Yes. We're going to use it as a piece of real estate. Okay. So it's a piece of real estate. What's the first rule of real estate? Buy it cheap. Buy it cheap. Yeah. Okay, got God, it. It was almost like we planned I that. I know. Dang. We bought it cheap. Okay, so yeah. we got this piece of real estate. Now, in order to buy real estate, you need to pay for it. So under the financial guru, Mr. Ramsey would say, you must pay cash for that rental real estate. Right. Okay, so we're going to put a half a million dollars of our money inside this house. Here it is. Mm -hmm. How much do we earn on the $500,000 inside the house? I don't know. Nothing. Okay. You, we purchased an asset with it. Right. The only thing that makes any significant rate of return is the asset itself. Right. The asset itself will appreciate in value. Yes. It will generate income. But wouldn't it have generated income and appreciated in value if we had put the bank's money in there as well? Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. But if we put our money in there, how much are we earning on the 500 grand that we put in there? Nothing. Nothing. Right. Okay? That doesn't mean that paying cash for things like that is a bad idea in every circumstance. It right. just means you have to you have to get a grip on where the rate of return comes from in an investment. Right. Okay, so if we put the bank's money into that piece of real estate and then we put a tenant in that piece of real estate and the tenant is paying the mortgage on the real estate, who's paying for the asset that we're now controlling with other people's money? The tenant. Yeah. Yeah. But whose money is sitting idle in the property while we're doing it? The banks. The banks. And what's your money doing? Buying money. that, buying that wonderful outfit. <laughs> That's right. Okay, buying exactly. Kitchen faucets. <laughs> kitchen faucets. <laughs> so that's that's a principle in business. Now it doesn't work when you put that in a boat. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm picking on you over there, Aaron. But Does Aaron want a boat? Aaron, I, I am just picking I wasn't on Aaron here for this conversation. <laughs> okay, so it doesn't work when you buy a boat because the boat is not an appreciating asset. Mm -hmm. So what you're doing is you're putting your own money into that asset and you're losing money or you're putting the bank's money into the asset and losing money on top of paying interest on losing the money. Okay. You could argue that, right? But yeah. if you were talking about business, if we're talking about long-term investments and things like that, you're, you're hopefully deploying your money or your, your, at whatever activity you're doing, you're doing it strategically with the plan to make a rate of return. Right. right. You're not just winging it, you know, and crossing your fingers. You're analyzing the heck out of this deal. Yeah. And then the question is, whose money are you going to use to control that deal? Mm -hmm. Right. Whose money are you going to go after, you know, to use to go after the deal? Right. right? So that's a principle I learned many years ago yeah. that I still argue with realtors. Oh. oh, no, I get a rate of return on my money. And blah, blah, blah. Uh, yeah. really? How, no, how you is don't. that possible? You, right. you now you, you have one asset and you now you have magically two rates of return. <laughs> like. The only rate of return you get is when you pull the money back out and you sell it for more right. and now you can redeploy the money, yeah. right? So there you go. Mm, okay, <laughs> cool. So when should people like bring in a financial planner? How, how do they, how do Good we know question. when we need one? Like how, you know, tell us about that. Uh, that's a, that's an excellent question actually. It really is. Well, yes, it is. It's almost like you've done this before. <laughs> Um, it's an excellent question, and the answer depends. And you're going to hear that a lot. Really, you sound it does like depend. A lawyer. You sound like I sound like I work at a law firm. Yes. Uh, what I suggest to folks is if they start from the basics, and and using that financial entertainer as the basic beginning is a great place. The fundamentals. When you get to the point where you know that your family is safe, you have the right life insurance, the right homeowners and car insurance, rental insurance, your income is healthy and good, and you've got lots of cash in the bank. Now, people ask, what's lots of cash? Right. Well, save up as much cash as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. Don't let anybody tell you, you should invest it all the time. You should be mm -hmm. investing. No, 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 no. Hold on. Who had all the money to buy houses in 2009 and 10? Right. Yeah. People with cash. Right. And before that, they were telling people like me with lots of cash, mm -hmm. oh, you should invest that. Right. No, no, no. I'm I'm fine. No, I'm gonna be ready. Liquid. I'm gonna be ready for an opportunity or an emergency. Right. Okay. So 
when you get to the point where you are covering emergencies and opportunities more than you think you'll ever need, okay, great. Now it's time maybe to have a conversation with a financial planner to help you deploy that additional cash flow. Okay. To help you put a plan in place to deploy that cash flow and start looking at, okay, where am I going to put this money? Where am I going to put this excess? Because yeah. we have a certain amount. Um, the first time I'd ever had this conversation, I'll never forget it. And it was a, a nice older couple that were introduced by a CPA. Okay. And people ask all the time, how much is enough to have in the bank? Well, that depends. Mm -hmm. These folks had three and a half million dollars in their checking account. Oh my gosh. And a penny less scares the heck out of her. Yes. She is a depression era right. grandchild. Mm -hmm. it, it was just em emblazed in her family. Cash yes. in the bank, right? Yeah. You, she was terrified. Anything less than that. Mm -hmm. So she had more than that, though. Mm -hmm. So the question they were asking is, what do we do with the excess? They were blessed to have built an incredibly successful business. And the answer was... Leave the three and a half million dollars and just be happy and comfortable. And she likes her checkbook. Yeah. And by the way, she still balanced her Balances checkbook. It, yeah. She squeezes three and a half million into her checkbook. Okay, it's amazing. It's a tiny box. She loves to balance her yeah. checkbook. But that's when she they actually should have had a financial planner many many years prior. Yeah. They should have had an estate planning attorney. All of these things. Yeah. That's okay. It's all much better today. But <laughs> the. First question was, what do I do with the excess? And the excess was five other checking accounts. Mm -hmm. The excess over 3.5 mm -hmm. because that was her comfort because level. Because she just kept her checking account. That yeah. was in her mind because her husband didn't do the books. Okay. She was the bookkeeper. Yeah. And, and so that was where our conversation started going. And it led to conversations about charitable giving. It led to yeah. legacy planning. They bought life... <gasps> They bought cash value life insurance. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. That Dave they bought, Ramsey's they just going to die. I know. It's terrible. They bought cash value life insurance that will leave over $5 million tax-free to their family. Mm. Generational wealth will right. transfer tax-free. It's just exciting stuff. But it all came from just the basic conversation about what do I do with my excess? Yeah. And that's when a financial planner is, is valuable to have a conversation with. You may not necessarily want to engage a financial planner who charges you a fee. Okay. I encourage folks to seek efficiency first. Mm. Meaning you don't the 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 fee only financial planner wants yeah. to charge you 2 3000 dollars for a plan. Right. You may just need a complimentary consultation that kind of nudges you in the right direction. Okay. I had that with someone that I'll be meeting with next week and they got nudged by me mm -hmm. um, about almost 3 years ago. Okay. That here's a direction that you might want to take with your excess savings. Yeah. Well, six hundred thousand dollars later, oh, it makes a heck of a lot more sense for them to actually now engage mm -hmm. with a financial planning team because we can be more yeah. efficient, right. not having to charge what we have to charge for beginning accounts. Right. That's a really important piece that the financial planning community, we would love to be a discount for everyone. Mm -hmm. But we have to pay a lot of money for access to the world of investing. We have to charge commensurate with where people begin. Right. So in that case, it was a complimentary call and a meeting actually back then. And I helped him with some life insurance, did some good basic planning. We did a living trust. We did some good stuff yeah. uh, through our law firm. And then here's your plan. Yeah. And they set about that investment plan. And $600,000 later... They've done a great job mm -hmm. and their business has grown and we have reconnect every year and yeah. it's time. It's yeah. time for them to really actually look because their income has grown. It's time for them to look towards college planning and all these right. things yeah. that weren't on the table before. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So it's really not a specific number. Um, it's more yeah. like, do I have excess over, you know, my comfort level in terms of being able to handle yep. emergencies and opportunities? Yep. If you're there then at least call you or someone yes, like you. Yes, absolutely. And, and kind of assess. Assess it and, and be, be cautious. And again, I'll use this term, I am militant with my money. Mm -hmm. So there's many different ways to work with financial planners. And um, I met a gentleman at my car show recently who had gone out and, and done that uh, research of financial professionals. And 
Some of the financial professionals he met had quoted very expensive fees to help him with his financial planning. And it, it scared him because yeah. even though he has the money, it was a lot for him because he right. is also, he's, he's just very cautious. Yeah. Um, and he ended up seeing something that I did on Facebook okay. and then he came in to visit mm -hmm. and, and he asked me what I suggested. And we had, I had a very different approach and it fit and it was a good fit for him. And okay. we're going to work together. Uh, we'll see each other next week to kind of begin the process. The, the whole point in that was, it, it was several pieces. One, do your homework, but don't be fast to jump in. Mm -hmm. Two, find somebody that you fit with, that you, that you connect yeah. with. Right. Yeah. So it turns out we're both car guys. Okay. Right. We're, we're both Perfect. car guys. And, yes. you know, so that was kind of an initial connection. Right. right? Uh, I lust after his car. He doesn't <laughs> love to lust after my car. Oh. Such is life. Okay. Um, but well, what kind of car does he have? A Datsun. <laughs> what? I know really? a little of uh, this, this awesome little blue Datsun that is okay. just, I, my first car in California was a Datsun 710. Okay. <laughs> I was the first kid in my school to drive to school. Cause I had my license at 15 years old oh, in Maine. Okay. Yes. Right. So I was in the yearbook first mm, kid to school. Wow, oh yeah. I was so cool. cool. Yes. Yeah, Datsun. That's your claim to fame. <laughs> yes. Well, so I, I love his car. We we were talking about his car and he says, Hey, I saw your video on Facebook and, okay. and that's how we connected. And, it was interesting that he'd already gone through this research process and been kind of scared away from the idea. Mm -hmm. uh, so back to your original, that question was when, well, it's when you feel like you, you've, you've got enough to actually do it. It's now time to talk about how to do it. Yeah. One of the things that I do is I explain to folks the multiple ways they can work with my firm, mm -hmm. right? Because we're a hybrid firm yeah. that we don't have to do it one way or the other. We can right. do it in any one of two, three, four different ways, that's yeah. fine. But we'll explain the options and I'll give my feedback on what I think is appropriate. And then folks can decide where they go from there. But that's yeah. the right time is when you reach that level, you know, that level of comfort with your opportunity and emergency funds and your cash flow, you know, and yeah. your, you know, your expenses, right? Yes. You're ready to go. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Very good. Now I so want a Datsun. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did not see that coming. I know. I, I was really surprised when you said you were lusting after a Datsun. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great little car. You never know. <laughs> um, okay. So kind of switching gears to, or maybe it's not switching gears. I don't know. Retirement. Mm. What should people be, you know, so probably most of our listeners are like in their 30s and 40s. Gotcha. So what Young you, like us. Got of it. Of course. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Got it. Um, what would you tell those people about retirement planning? What should they be thinking about start, or doing? Start today mm -hmm. uh, and become a student. Mm. I, 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 I think about this often, that the, the key to retirement planning is to be a student of retirement planning. And that means bringing in information from more than just one type of source. And I'll say it, financial entertainers are not the right independent source. They are right. not the right source. Um, they're, they're good for inspiration and for conversation, but don't stop there. Have a conversation, interview financial planners, go out and get other perspectives, ask questions, and then challenge the status quo, challenge conventional wisdom, right? If you have somebody who just flat out says, this is the way you're supposed to do it, Holly, mm -hmm. I really want you to step back and go, mm, really? Who says right. that? Does everybody say that? Is that, is that right? And just ask why and why it is. And, and when you start to dive in a little deeper into most of these absolutes, this is the way we do it, you find out eh, there's a bit more nuance to it, right? right? There's a way more nuance. Yes. So start early. You know, even if you're late to the game, start now. Yeah. Become a student for it, asking questions, right? But most importantly, start from the fundamentals. If you think about a castle, Right, the old timey, you know, ancient uh, Game of Thrones castle. Yeah, the wealthy of old built their castle on a hill or in a very easily protected place. Mm. So start your retirement planning from a position of safety, meaning your car insurance, home insurance, life insurance, all of that is in place so that no one or no thing can interrupt your future plans. Okay. You don't you can't be sued out of existence. Right. Right. Nowadays litigious society, those dang lawyers. Those dang lawyers. I tell you, those yes. lawyers. <laughs> but you want to start from a position of safety. Yeah. Right. Making sure that you're protected. Low risk. Yeah. yeah. And then build a foundation. Okay. So the foundation of the castle is built on stone. 
It's Mm -hmm. cash in the world of finance. It's cash on hand. It's that savings account. Build from a position where you know when an opportunity presents itself, you're going to be able to take advantage of it. When an emergency comes up, you're going to be able to take advantage of it. Okay. Then you start investing. But the question about investing, man, that is different for everybody. Are you a Wall Street investor? Do you really want to get into the Wall Street thing? Great. Do you want to have the DIY approach or do you want someone to help you with your investments? Do you love real estate? Do you love cryptocurrencies and things like that? Great. Um, All of these things are great if you become a student of them. Okay. Right. So I I have a, a client recently who just wants to be in that next step, that invest, invest, invest. Mm-hmm. They're ready to go. They've got yeah. all their protection in place. They've got a great foundation. They're ready. Okay. And we started talking about different types of investing. And the one that that she is supremely passionate about is real estate. Okay. Like real estate. Yeah. Absolute real estate. Well, so would you say that real estate is one of like the safest investments? No, nothing okay. is quote safe. The okay. only thing that's safe is cash in the bank, uh, cash value life insurance, and maybe the money in the backyard if you remember where you put it. <laughs> okay. Right? Yeah. Everything else has risk, right? right? All different levels of risk. I am a big fan of real estate, but the point with that was that in her case, she has she does not have a passion for or any kind of interest at all in the Wall Street investment right. process. It's yeah. not that she's been burned by it, but she has a passion for real estate. And she asked me about that. Mm-hmm. And I just said, here are five resources that if you just go home and immerse yourself in this this education, yeah. which is all free at right. this point, and then let's come back and talk. Well, a year with within a year, she came back and she is now building houses with a syndicated investment group uh, back east. Okay. She's wow. she's uh, 37 years old building houses wow. and sells them, okay. right? With a syndicated investment group that yeah. she met through her research and if you if you wanted an expert in that type of real estate, she would be your yeah. person to talk to, right? Now I have because other, she was interested in it. She and was, she, yeah, she was yeah. passionate so about it. It was easy for her to go deep into it, become a student of it. Yes, I think yes. that's that's what you're saying, right? Is like if you're not interested in something, but it's like everybody else is doing it, like it's probably yeah. not going to go as well. No, you you got to really be involved in it. Uh, yeah. A gentleman just two weeks ago asked me about invest, 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 and I said, "Well, great. Tell me what you're thinking." And he was just ready to dive headlong into buying businesses and flipping them online. Mm. He knew nothing. <laughs> he literally knew nothing, maybe less than nothing, about buying and flipping businesses online. And yeah. he asked me what I thought, and I said, "Holy mackerel! I don't care if you got two hundred and ninety thousand dollars. Stop what you're doing, and 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 whoa!" I and yeah. and I see we're not working together. I said, "But my my advice is." you shouldn't be thinking about doing anything for the next six months unless you're actually a smarter investor in that particular topic. Right. And he didn't like that. Mm. So he is likely buying something right now <laughs> <laughs> that that will be a bad idea, but such is life. Yeah. I just think that if that's your passion, that's great, but go become a student of it. So retirement yeah. investing being an ed- being very well educated is easy these days, right? That's yeah, very there's it's, so much it's information so much available. A little too much right. and some very biased information these days. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that's my issue is that that the financial entertainers really dominate that freedom of speech channel yeah. because they can say whatever they want and it can be as pretty as you want it to, to sound to you. Right. Yeah. I'm not allowed to do that. Mm-hmm. Like you'll notice in this interview that there are certain words I won't say mm-hmm. because I'm not allowed to say them without okay. major federal oversight. Right. Yeah. I don't have that freedom of speech, right? right. Say the word. No, can't do <laughs> I know, it. Now I'm like, no. what are the words? No, are the it, words? It, if we say those words, then we have to say what her middle name is, but we won't do it. <laughs> okay. Now, so so that was just be a student. One of the other items is is to think ahead, right? Mm-hmm. I love that future casting. Have you heard that phrase before? Yes, future yes. casting. I love future casting. And, and I'll use myself as an example, right? 10 years ago, if I future casted myself and I look at my dream list and I, I go and I check it out. And I'm like, Oh, these are the things I want. Well, 10 years later. No, Mm. 
Mm. Those are not the same. Yeah. Right. Is retirement, is retirement age the same for me? No, it is mm. not. It is totally different. It's a very Has different line. Has it gotten line. higher or lower? It's gotten longer out. Okay. Because yeah. what I do can be done from anywhere right. and I can, I can do things that I want to do yes. at the times that I want to do it. So it's not like a set timeline. Right. So the idea though is to think ahead and to future cast yourself out and to really get yeah. more of a visual on what you imagine retirement would look like, okay. right? And then perhaps have a conversation with a financial planner who tells you the idea of you selling your house in Southern California and moving to Hawaii <laughs> is not really an, a, an item that's going to work mathematically. Yeah. And then blowing up their world. I'm so sorry if you're watching. Um, <laughs> because it was, you, you ha if you don't have a future cast to put everything in benchmark what you're doing, yeah. then you really have no idea whether or not it's just like in your business. When you make your projections, you've got to have your numbers. Well, if yeah. you have no future cast mindset right. about where you want to end up, yeah. how will you even know if what you're doing today is even going right. to get you there, right? Yeah. I'm not saying that I'm that negative guy. You know, I think that everybody, everybody should have that dream, um, but everybody has their number. Yeah. And what I mean by that is your number is different than my number. Right. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. As long as you're working within those guidelines, right? right. You're not working way beyond them, yeah. right? So that you're setting yourself up for a future casted goal that just isn't achievable. Right. right? Yeah. So have that first, right? Know where you're going. Okay. And I mean that all the way down to where are you going? Mm -hmm. I asked clients three, uh, uh, three days ago. Where will you end up? Are you going to end up in California? Are you going to end up in Tennessee, Florida, mm -hmm. Texas? They have family everywhere. Where are you going to be? Oh, we don't know. Oh. So, so how in the world can you plan for retirement if you right. don't know whether or not you're going to have a, a home in Tennessee or a yeah. home in Florida, wherever? And, and that stopped them in their tracks. Mm -hmm. So they're now booking flights to go visit family, <laughs> family in research. Tennessee. Research, yes. Because that was my <laughs> advice. Retirement research. Was go fly to Tennessee, yeah. see your grandkids. But then... Contact a realtor and go shopping. Right. Don't buy a house. Just go yeah. shopping. Yeah. Right? They'll probably buy yes. a house. <laughs> right? So that's the, that's one of those things. Okay. As you do retirement planning, future casting it means a lot. Mm -hmm. it, 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 you think about where you want to live. Like the size of my house in retirement has changed over oh, the years. Okay. Yeah. I future cast myself out. And, and the more and more I have planned my own with Amy and I, it's a single family home, mm -hmm. level entry, with not a lot of land to deal with because I don't want to be found face down in the 50 acres <laughs> in, in the, the backyard. backyard. Yeah. And I need to be able to get my rascal scooter in the front door. Oh, okay. <laughs> Right. That's yeah. that's like the ideal house. Doesn't mean that I don't want to have hiking trails and a lake and yeah, other things nearby. to go nearby right. or on the property. Mm -hmm. I just those are things that have changed. It used to be very different. I want a home theater and blah blah, blah oh, all this stuff. Like yeah. eh, I don't care about anything. Yeah. Right. So it has changed over the years. I want a okay. seven car garage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Smaller house, bigger garage. Bigger garage <laughs> and my wood shop. That's yeah. all that's all we need, right? Yeah. Yeah. So okay. Hopefully that kind of answers some yeah. of it, but retirement planning is just future casting is a big part of it. Yeah. Um, okay. So speaking of future casting, you know, you can future cast all day long. Sometimes, you know, life throws you a curveball. Yes. So um, if somebody has gone through a divorce and they mm -hmm. just now have, you know, basically lost half their assets to their mm -hmm. now ex-spouse, what is the quickest way for them to rebuild their wealth? Hmm. That's a good one. Okay. The smart ass in me wants to say certain things, but I won't. <laughs> <clears throat> so I, I actually have counseled folks through this. The, um, the, I think the biggest piece to start with is to go right back to the fundamentals. Okay. Right. Um, and I, the fundamentals, Fundamental, say what the fundamentals, the fundamentals are. being make sure that you're safe. Now, very first thing, if you have children, make sure that you are building your life. If you're going to restart, then build this. And I'm going to use personal experience. Okay. okay. I had to restart. I was divorced against my will long ago. And I was in a position where I had to restart. I wasn't thinking from maybe the, the sophisticated level that I might have achieved now 20 years later, because I, I am in a much more advanced level of thinking about these things today. But back then, I reset with Madeline in mind first. I changed my entire life. Madeline I, is your daughter. My daughter, Madeline. I changed my life because she staggered over and hugged my leg and she became real. That was my moment of connection with her, right? right? Before she was just a little blob, I could drop her off, right? 
But some dads, they don't really connect until they, you know, the kid has got yes. animation and starts, you know, there. Right. So she staggered over, hugged my leg, and I sold my Harley mm. and changed my life. And then she and I, oh. and I changed my work. I, I left my job. Mm. I went fully self-employed, started down this path of becoming a financial planner yeah. and so that I could build my whole life around her, okay. right? And, and being available for her because the world just flipped upside down. Yes. So I would encourage anybody going through that. If you have family, number one, take really good care of yourself. Mm -hmm. That if you're not focusing on your own personal well-being, you will not be able to focus on others, right? right. So if you see, if you're feeling that, You've got to definitely deal with that, however yeah. that is for you. For me, it was focusing on little Miss Madeline and, uh, you know, daddy-daughter things just mm -hmm. became the, the norm. Yeah. So then from there, back to the beginning, safety, making sure that whatever you build now, no one can come and take it. Make sure your car insurance is bulletproof, your home insurance, mm -hmm. your liability insurance, your life insurance to protect those people you care about. If you're gone all of a sudden, you've got to replace the ATM machine. Yeah, You are the only ATM machine on your side of the equation. Right, It's up to you, but if you've got people who rely on you, mm -hmm. you got to protect them. Yeah. So again, fundamentals, protection, savings. Mm -hmm. Make sure you have plenty of cash on hand. Don't be reliant on anyone to tell you when to take advantage of an opportunity. Build yourself into the position where you can be ready and then become a student of whatever it is that you want to future cast yourself into. Mm -hmm. um, I've spoken to folks who've gone through divorce that became realtors. And and uh, one of my clients now today is uh, one of the most successful realtors in Dallas. And okay. she started as a nobody real estate agent in the Dallas metro area yeah. um, after divorce. Mm. Divorced against her will as well. Right. You know, shocking. All of a sudden she's divorced with two kids. Yes. An amazing realtor now. She okay. dominates, yeah. right? Uh, another lady right here in the uh, area where we live uh, here in Corona, uh, she went down a self-employed path because mm -hmm. she wanted to start her own business. Yeah. Crazy idea. But she did it. <laughs> she did it in a very in a very systematic way. Mm -hmm. She Fundamentals were all in place. And then she started her own business and she's just, just cranking. Yeah. And she has a, she has a wonderful little daughter that has grown up with her mom fully there all the time because the business that she built um, is allows her that freedom. So I guess that take care of yourself first, mm -hmm. take care of those who rely on you, then protect everything you're about to build mm -hmm. and then become a student of whatever it is that you're about to go down in that path. Yeah. Right. That's, that's really the key for me is that that student mentality right. that you can go be a cog in the wheel and enjoy the cubicle. <laughs> And you can make a paycheck. You can. Yeah, yeah. You can make a paycheck. But if you want freedom, mm -hmm. that that uh, that really easy path, like you and I have chosen to be self-employed, <laughs> so easy. So easy. It's you're like like Holly. No sleepless nights no, at all. You're an overnight success. How many years yes. overnight? Yes. I forget. Right. Uh, almost twenty. Yeah, twenty <laughs> years overnight. Bam, you're a success. Yes. But that that for me is after a divorce, which is just a kick in the teeth. Right. Yes. It is. It is a divorce is the best diet plan ever though. <laughs> oh, I lost so much weight. Yes. It was amazing. <laughs> I haven't tried it yet. But. No, don't try it. <laughs> Do not try. I'm just telling you, it's yes. just I personal experience. Yes. Not good. Um. And, and uh, the the thing is that it's an opportunity to restart. And so I say opportunity. Say, Craig, is I love the examples that you gave because all of those examples are basically people that took the opportunity of divorce to completely redesign their life mm -hmm. and like level up, right? I mean, it sounds yeah. like all of those people are now living a much better life probably than even when they were married. There is. And, and I'll say for me personally, as I go back and I look at the last 20 some odd years, uh, that... My my wife Amy today right would uh, she's heard this before where I say I don't have anything nice and she says you mean um, your workshop your Porsches your tractors <laughs> uh, you know your your home in Maine and all that like yeah. yeah I guess maybe I have some good <laughs> stuff and I say that as more of an affirmation to myself because yeah. I know I have a lot of great things and mm -hmm. my daughter Madeline benefited tremendously from the direction that our lives had taken. Now, not as ideal as maybe life could have been, but when I look at all the time that I've spent, let's just say that when when Madeline calls to give big news, she calls 
my wife, her stepmom first. Yeah. That's pretty amazing. I found yeah. an amazing lady, right? Yeah. And she calls me to talk about things that I wish she wouldn't talk about. <laughs> Right, You're that, like I don't need to know. I that. don't know. Don't I don't like. Oh my gosh, yes. she shares too much. I'm like, no more talking. You know, you say maybe not as ideal, but maybe it's even better. You never know. You never. You know. never know. It's not the. It's. It's just. It is a different direction. When I look yeah. back at all that we've done, and and you know what um, what Amy and I have built together, but what Madeline has become, my daughter has become, and all these things, and and where we're at, I'm like. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah. It's all right. Yeah. You know, but well, that's I that think, reset. Yes. And I think that's like, let's end on a high note. <laughs> that's, a, that's a best place to end. Um, so, but tell everybody, where can they find you? I know you work at a law firm. My yep. firm sends all of this type of work to Craig's firm. So <laughs> tell the people where they can find you if they want to work the, with you. The best place to actually, if you want to search for me, it's it's Craig with a K, K-R-A-I-G-S-T-R-O-M.com. Now that does, that does shoot you right to my LinkedIn page, but it's always interesting. If you want to Google my name, um, the last time I, I had somebody do it, it was six pages of Google. Oh, all my bad stuff is on page 19, <laughs> but, uh, it, so you'll always be able to find me. So yes. my law firm page comes up. You can search Craig with right. a K Strom. You, you can email me Craig with a K at Craig All of that easy to find. Okay. Very good. <laughs> Craig, thank you so much for being here today. You're welcome. <laughs> It was awesome. I have just a little bit more to say. Some people might think that talking about money does feel superficial and that money really doesn't matter. But, you know, money is the thing that buys us the basic needs, food, clothing, and shelter. And if you don't have that, it's really hard to show up as the best version of yourself and truly thrive in your life. You're more in survival mode. If you've ever had this situation, you know what I'm talking about. You know, at the top of the episode, when Aaron and I were talking about how money really can't buy you happiness, it does buy you security. And you have to have security before you can even think about showing up as the best version of yourself in your life. Please like, comment, subscribe, and don't ever forget, you were made for more.